On the Spot with Michelle McCrory is brought to you by MELD, the next generation decentralized global bank. BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager and a leading contender for a spot Bitcoin ETF, is now moving into Bitcoin mining. BlackRock has reportedly invested in four of the five largest Bitcoin miners by market cap. And this comes after BlackRock shocked the traditional finance industry by applying for a spot Bitcoin ETF. A dramatic shift in sentiment given that in 2017, CEO Larry Fink said that crypto was essentially just an index for how much money laundering is being done in the world. And given BlackRock's near-perfect record for ETF filing approvals, bets are that they will likely get this one through too. And this has some Bitcoin purists concerned that between owning miners and a spot ETF, BlackRock could consolidate too much Bitcoin power and that this could jeopardize the decentralized mission. Meanwhile, WorldCoin's mission to register every human's biometric data may be hitting some snags. The controversial cryptocurrency project led by Sam Altman, that's the brains behind ChatGPT, uses eyeball scanning orbs to enroll people, and it's facing increased scrutiny from regulators worldwide. The WorldCoin token, WLD, linked to the project soared during the launch, with over 2 million signups, but it has tanked around 50% in the last 30 days. So does this mean that those that flag this as a possible dystopian tool of control and oppression can take some comfort that it may not go anywhere, or do we still need to be very, very concerned? Well, here to give us his insights and analysis on these topics and more is George Gammon. George is a renowned investor, macroeconomics expert, and the host of the Rebel Capitalist Show. He's also an entrepreneur and an educator, gaining lots of popularity with his unique ability to explain complex topics in clear, easy to understand ways. George, good to have you with us. Welcome to Kitco. Oh, thank you for having me. That's quite an intro. We certainly have lots to discuss with you. And as I was saying earlier, it's hard to figure out exactly where to start picking your brain. But I do want to get your thoughts on this development that we've had regarding BlackRock. BlackRock, of course, the world's largest asset manager, now buying a big stake in miners. According to Finbolt, citing CNN data, BlackRock invested in four of the five largest Bitcoin miners by market cap. And these include Riot Platforms, Marathon Digital Holdings, Cypher Mining, and TerraWolf. And BlackRock is now the second largest shareholder in all of these companies. And this current position also makes BlackRock a major member of the Bitcoin Mining Council, which is a lobbying group for the Bitcoin mining industry here in the U.S., so keeping in mind, George, that BlackRock also is waiting for that spot Bitcoin ETF approval. And we have CEO Larry yeah. Fink now saying that Bitcoin should be seen as a hedge against currency devaluation. A very big change in sentiment from when he dismissed Bitcoin as an index for money laundering. What do you make of this move? Yeah, well, first of all, Larry Fink, I mean, you've got to call a spade a spade here. He's just moving from one grift to the next, you know, he was all about ESG and he didn't care about the environment. He didn't care about saving whales or baby seals or icebergs or anything like that. He's care he cares about one thing that's making money and assets under management. So he's just going to go from one hot topic to the next hot topic. And now he's just focuses attention on Bitcoin. That's no uh, poor reflection on Bitcoin. I just want to first kind of set the table by understanding kind of Larry Fink's motivation here. Uh, as far as the specific process, you know, this could be a problem. I don't really, I haven't got into the back end plumbing of how this works too in depthly. Uh, for that, you'd have to follow my good friend and business partner, Lynn Alden, on uh, Twitter as an example. So I'm sure she's really understands the ins and outs there. But my view of Bitcoin has always been it's something that you should own to have purchasing power outside of the system, regardless of, of really what the price does. Um, but my long term view was even if we went to a let's call it a Bitcoin standard where Bitcoin was used as global money and that was the reserve currency under that type of system, although it may work well uh, for a decade or two, eventually we're going to go right back to where we are today. And why do I say that? Because you can have perfect money 
And if it's controlled by imperfect human beings, eventually it will behave imperfectly. And you just, Bitcoin doesn't change people. It doesn't change our hardwiring. So my point there is you've got this really cool currency that was set up in, in a way to promote decentralization. And it was a way to kind of definancialize our economy. And unfortunately, when you got guys like Larry Fink trying to take control over it, he's going to take it right back to you know what he does with everything. And that's even more financialization. And so um, for, for me, it doesn't really change the use case for Bitcoin. And that's mm -hmm. having uh, purchasing power outside of the system uh, as a result of moving what I think is very quickly towards a central bank digital currency and more of an uh, authoritative approach or an authoritarian approach from these world governments. Uh, I think that's the main reason to hold it. But, um, you know, well, what this does as far as the financialization, I don't really like it. But, uh, you know, I guess that's just my two cents. Well, we're here to get your two cents, George. But I want to expand on this idea that it may actually hurt the overall vision of Bitcoin. Now, I get your point that you're saying a vision is great, but it all comes down to human nature at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. But Bitcoin is supposed to offer an alternative to traditional finance. And now we've got one of the biggest players in traditional finance getting into the space. Firstly, as we've said, they've also applied for the spot Bitcoin ETF, which could see a lot of Bitcoin custodied at a centralized institution. And as you just mentioned, it's not just an asset manager, it's BlackRock, which uh, many have viewed in somewhat of a darker, sinister light. We know that BlackRock quite proudly uses its power to enforce its broader agenda like ESG, environmental, social and governance policies. Uh, we've had CEO Larry Fink say it very, very clearly that he uses BlackRock's financial clout to leverage, as leverage to force companies to comply with the ESG mantra and what he calls good behaviors. We, he's, he's on record saying that. So he has since said that the term has been weaponized and sort of backpedaled a bit. But now we have this concern that BlackRock could have too much power over Bitcoin if its ETF is approved. And then on top of that, you have this little detail in the BlackRock filing which people flagged initially, but now as they're moving into the mining space, it could be problematic. And I'm referring to this part in the filing in, in the application for Bitcoin ETF, where it states, should Bitcoin experience a hard fork, that is an agreed upon change to its underlying code, BlackRock will use its discretion to determine which version of Bitcoin is the appropriate network for the trust's purposes. So George- of course the they will. Well, so, <laughs> shocker, right, Michelle? <laughs> so, so the fear here is that BlackRock may push for a hard fork of Bitcoin, which could transform the coin from proof of work to proof of stake, because proof of stake deemed more environmentally friendly, very contrary to the mission and ethos of Bitcoin, but deemed more ESG friendly. And of course, that would compromise Bitcoin's democratic and decentralized division. And a while back, journalist Chris Black spelt it out quite clearly and he tweeted or X'd, as I believe the verb is now, he posted on X, <laughs> um, BlackRock, runs first and largest Bitcoin ETF, becomes wildly successful, heavily funds Bitcoin development, proposes regulatory and eco-friendly proof of stake fork, loses community opinion, but adopts fork as Bitcoin anyway, proof of work fork just for pirates and El Salvador, mm. right? So now, Looks like they're investing heavily into the Bitcoin development. So quite a large, long setup there to get your thoughts on this. I mean, how concerned yeah, they're trying to should be, we be? They're trying to become vertically integrated, I think, is is the right word in the ecosystem. And I think it's we need to look beyond just the ESG mantra or narrative. And what as you're saying this, when you're describing this, the first thing that's coming into my head is about Larry Fink and his affiliation with the World Economic Forum. And uh, I always call kind of the global elite and the World Economic Forum is leading the charge there as the Marxist Malthusian cult. And that may seem extreme to some people, but if you actually look what their objectives are, it's straight from Thomas Malthus in the 1800s. And the bottom line is we have way too many people and we live on a planet with scarce resources. So we need to limit the 
consumption of resources, and we need to limit or decrease the population. And so Larry Fink is, is on board with this. He's, he's a C-level executive, if you will, in the Marxist Malthusian cult. So the fact that he would have this much control over the Bitcoin ecosystem, if in fact it plays out this way, uh, should be very worrisome to anybody who values uh, freedom, liberty, and free market capitalism. What is Larry Fink's uh, relationship with the World Economic Forum? Oh my gosh, he, he's, 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 he, he's, well, I don't know for sure because I've never been to Davos, uh, but he goes there every single time. And the, the reason why I think he's so tight with Klaus Schwab as an example, it's just like same reason with Justin Trudeau, same reason with Biden, and same thing with like Mark Binioff as an example of Salesforce. And so whenever you hear Klaus Schwab speak, uh, you, he uses certain words. He describes things in a certain way. As an example, when he was talking about COVID being a, quote unquote, unique opportunity. And then sure enough, two weeks later, you start seeing all of these people describe COVID the exact same way. It's like mm -hmm. they had a script. So now I totally understand that if you have one view on, like as an example, we were talking about my good buddy, Hugh Hendry, and we may have a similar view on the dollar, but we're not going to use the exact same words like we're reading off a telemarketing script. And if you look at Trudeau, if you look at Biden, Benioff, and especially Larry Fink, they, they literally have gotten a script from the World Economic Forum, maybe straight from Klaus Schwab, because they're all saying the exact same thing the exact same way. So that's why, uh, among many other reasons, I lump him into that Malthusian Marxist cult. Okay, so how concerned should we be that BlackRock continues to fund Bitcoin development, continues to vertically integrate, as you say, and we've just listed how it's purchased some miners, potentially gets this Bitcoin spot ETF approval, and then creates a hard fork which would turn Bitcoin into proof of stake and nullifies, I guess, part of the mission. What, what do you make of that? How concerned are you about that? Yeah, again, I'm no expert on the back end plumbing and how this works. So I don't want to uh, speak too much on that. But I think it depends on why you own Bitcoin. So if, if I own Bitcoin because I want the price to go up, well, this is probably a good thing. This would give it some mm -hmm. tailwind. But if I own Bitcoin because I have certain views that, let's say, are about, that revolve around sound money, uh, that revolve around Austrian economics, that revolve around libertarianism, then I would see this as a bad thing. And what if you own Bitcoin as a potential way to protect yourself against a central bank digital currency, a CBDC, and then you bring in the other conspiracy theory, which granted is a conspiracy theory, that Bitcoin in fact is a Trojan horse for a CBDC, that it lays the groundwork for people to accept this idea of a digital currency conceptually and is really a way of introducing it to the masses in terms of adoption, in terms of usage, and is really the way to facilitate a CBDC. When you combine that idea with this notion that perhaps, as you just said, BlackRock is linked to the World Economic Forum and the agenda here is not so pure, what do you make of those two theories colliding? Well, I don't know how Bitcoin was started. I, I, don't, I don't think really any of us do. So whether it's a Trojan horse or not, I, I mean, who knows? But I do not think that it would be a way to roll out a central bank digital currency. And the reason I say that is because a central bank digital currency is just basically the dollar. It's just instead of the dollar being a liability of the commercial banking system, the dollar is a liability of the Federal Reserve. So as an example, I've got an account with Wells Fargo in the United States and all the dollars that I have are uh, an, an asset on my balance sheet and they're a liability on Wells Fargo's balance sheet. So if those dollar liabilities go from Wells Fargo's balance sheet to the Fed, which I think we'll most likely see within the next probably five years or so, then that is pretty much the fundamental, the foundation for a CBDC. And I always encourage my viewers to go through a thought experiment to understand the plumbing of a CBDC better. Because a lot of people think that it's something that's going to compete with a dollar. Like it's going to be called FedCoin or something like that. And you're going to have to choose between using that and dollars. But I always tell people or I encourage them to go through this thought experiment where how do you know that right now you're not using a CBDC? 
like, I think you're in New York right now. So I'd assume that maybe you went out for lunch, you go out to dinner tonight, uh, you go down to the local grocery store and you take your debit card and you're spending dollars. Well, how would you know if those dollars were a liability of your bank or a liability of the Fed? I mean, you say, well, the card says Wells Fargo. Well, so what? You think that they're going to tell you if that was now a liability of the Fed? They'd do it. Uh, they'd pull the wool over your eyes. You, you'd have no way of knowing that unless they came out and announced it, my, which is what my point is. And I don't know why they would announce it, especially when there's so much negative press around a CBDC. So the fact that a CBDC is just a, a dollar that's someone else's liability, I don't think they need Bitcoin to really roll that out at all. OK, but uh, let's focus then on how Bitcoin works in a world of a CBDC. Yeah. How do you see those interacting? Well, I think it still has massive value, okay. uh, at least for the reasons I own it. And I own it to have purchasing power outside of the system. So we can imagine this CBDC world where every single transaction is goes through the Fed's balance sheet and they just plug it into AI, some sort of algorithm. And that's where they get the real time data that they would need to give you like a social score, as an example. So in that environment, if you don't want the government knowing every single thing that you do, uh, I don't know that it's realistic to uh, you know, pay for everything in Bitcoin, at least not right now. Maybe in the future, we'll get there and that would be fantastic. Uh, but to go around and paying your rent in Bitcoin or physical gold or silver, I, I don't think that's gonna be realistic for most people. So then the question becomes, okay, if I have to have a bank account in the CBD system just to get my paycheck, if I'm just the average Joe working nine to five, then how do I take some of that purchasing power out of the ecosystem? And I think you do that by buying Bitcoin or physical gold. And then if you wanted to transact as much as possible outside of that system, hopefully you could take that Bitcoin or gold when you needed to buy something, turn it into cash, and then go ahead and pay your rent or pay your phone bill, something like that. Now, the, 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 the pushback there is gonna be, well, they'll try to ban cash and do, uh, maybe. That maybe I think that's the direction they'll go. But especially if you live in a country like Colombia, where 70 percent of the transactions are still settled in cash, although that may be the future, you've got a much uh, longer runway there. So let me bring it back to the BlackRock idea. And how does Bitcoin still operate as something out of the system if BlackRock does indeed get the spot Bitcoin ETF and does indeed continue to build out its vertical integration and buy more miners, can Bitcoin still be seen as an out of the system play? Oh, absolutely. Because you okay. can just take your Bitcoin, you can put in your back pocket and then you can just fly down to Columbia. Then you could go to a local Bitcoin cafe, as an example. You could trade your Bitcoin uh, for cash. Uh, if you, you have someone there that uh, you know just wants the Bitcoin, they've got the Colombian pesos. And then you just make that swap and then you've got the cash and you go buy whatever you want and the government doesn't know about it. That's not going to impact your social score. All right. So not all hope is lost if BlackRock really infiltrates the Bitcoin space. Speaking of the Bitcoin spot ETF, George, I want to get your thoughts on the latest developments regarding the likelihood of one getting approved. We did see that uh, Grayscale had a bit of a win, and we did see the price of Bitcoin surge on that news. A U.S. Courts of Appeal for the D.C. Circuit ruled that the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, was wrong to deny Grayscale permission to convert its popular Bitcoin trust into an ETF. The judge there saying that the denial of the proposal was arbitrary and capricious because the SEC failed to explain how it's different from similar products. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Grayscale is the first to get a spot Bitcoin ETF. But what does it mean in terms of your views of a, the prospects of a spot Bitcoin ETF being approved? Well, it's just becoming more financialized. So again, it depends on why you own Bitcoin. So if you own Bitcoin just because you want the price to go up, then I think this is good news. Absolutely, because the more ETFs, you know, the more demand that you have, the more accessible it is to uh, hedge funds, pension funds, et cetera, that's gonna be that much more demand with a very, very limited supply and a limited float, and that means price up. But if you're someone, and I would put myself in that camp, uh, that looks at Bitcoin from the standpoint of a libertarian or someone who uh, would view wealth not just as currency, but the ability 
to for in a society to create goods and services efficiently uh, than then freedom, liberty, privacy, et cetera, then this is definitely a negative. Right. So how does a spot Bitcoin ETF negate that libertarian mission? Expand on that. Oh, because you've, you've got more of the Bitcoin in the hands of the Malthusian uh, Marxist cult members. And I don't see how that's a good thing. <laughs> and, right. and then they're, they're financializing something that was meant to create an economy with uh, less financial products, you know, and, le and look at the boom bust cycle. You know, one of the reasons why we have these booms and these busts is because the government comes in, they have all these entities that have to be bailed out. They create this moral hazard. And then through that moral hazard, then you got Wall Street that just takes it to an extreme. And uh, the next thing you know, you've got mortgage backed securities, you've got derivatives that are valued at a quadrillion dollars. And it's this ticking time bomb. And, you know, if they do the exact same thing to Bitcoin, which I'm sure is their objective, then I don't see how that's a good thing if you value free market capitalism. And, uh, you know, go ahead. No, no, you're, you're making a point that has been made on the show before and certainly an issue that I've raised. And that is bringing Bitcoin into the traditional finance space in a way negates the mission of Bitcoin Absolutely. to be a counter to traditional finance. And when you have all of these spin-offs and derivatives and ETFs and futures markets, it makes the underlying asset so much more easy to manipulate. And in a way, it compromises the purity of Bitcoin and the purity of the mission. But you're still yeah. saying, go, go on. And let's not forget that the number one selling point for most Bitcoiners, I, I don't think this is a really one of my uh, things that I, I value too much, but it's the limited supply. You've got 21 million. That's it. There's never going to be more than that. And so my argument there is, well, you know, if it's a Bitcoin standard then they're most likely use fractional reserve banking uh, because that's just kind of human nature. But I think it goes even further than that. I mean, if with Bitcoin, with Larry Fink getting involved, with Wall Street getting involved, you're going to have paper Bitcoin and you're going to have a lot of paper Bitcoin, just like you have a paper gold market. And uh, for the purists out there, I don't know how on earth you could view that as as something good, especially when you're looking at that 21 million as one of the main advantages as to why Bitcoin might change our economy into something that instead of being constantly inflationary was constantly deflationary and all the benefits that would accrue to the poor and middle class as a result. OK, I uh, agreed. And as you say, we've seen the idea of paper gold being uh, a big way to manipulate the gold market. You have more paper gold than, than real gold out there. So if this does indeed happen to the Bitcoin market, does that change your view on holding Bitcoin, your personal view? No, because that's, again, that's not why I hold Bitcoin. I don't hold it because of the price going up or down. I, I just simply hold it uh, to have purchasing power outside of the system uh, in case, you know, as an example, uh, I think you probably know my good friend, Nigel Farage. I'm sure he's probably yes. been on your show many times. I would whatnot. like to get Nigel Farage on, but I haven't. But I know you're going to bring up the, the issue that he's been kicked out of his uh, banking system in the UK. That's but I'll, right. I'll have you elaborate on that. That's absolutely right. So Nigel get, got, gets unbanked. So what do you do? Like if you're unbanked and all your assets are in dollars and, you know, is Nigel just saying something that the government didn't like? I remember back in 2021 when I started the Rebel Capitalist channel about maybe three or four months into the channel, I got kicked off of YouTube because I had some views that were deemed inappropriate on or inappropriate on the uh, mandates, the vaccine mandates. So I just look at my channel. And, oh, it's gone. And they didn't put it back up until Joe Rogan was nice enough to retweet about it, saying, come on, YouTube, this is completely ridiculous. Then they go ahead and put it back up. But that's a good example mm -hmm. of you can just, and by the way, that whole time and everything that I was saying about COVID, that turned out to be correct. So I was on the right side of history, but yet my channel still gets banned. And I'm sure if I would have kept talking about it in a public fashion like Nigel uh, has in the past on, on that issue and several others, that they would have gone after my bank account. So if you're the average Joe out there and they go after your bank account because you say something they don't like or because your social score isn't where it needs to be in the case of a CBDC, then all of a sudden they freeze your account. How do you get paid? How do you do all these things? you got to have some form of purchasing power outside of the system. So if Nigel got unbanked, as an example, right. but all of his assets 
were in British pounds that were a liability of a commercial bank, his asset, all of a sudden he wakes up the next morning, he has no assets, he's done. But if he had some Bitcoin in his back pocket, then he could just get on the next plane, he could go down to Dubai, and he could somehow figure out a way to turn that Bitcoin into real life purchasing power that he could use to buy goods and services. So it, it's about having uh, you know, a plan B, really, is what we're talking about. It's about having a second passport. It's about having banks outside of your political jurisdiction. And it's about having purchasing power outside of the system, whether that's Bitcoin, uh, physical gold, I think some other more creative ways are to buy watches. I'm a big fan of Rolex watches. Uh, not too much because I, I wear them all the time, but I like to keep them in storage because that's another asset that if you know if the stuff hits the fan and you're Nigel Farage, you can just throw that watch right on your wrist, go down to Dubai, and turn that into immediate purchasing power. That the central planners, the the Malthusian cult, as an example, they can't do anything about that. Where they can do something about your dollar assets that are a liability of a commercial bank. Right, and just to clarify for our viewers, Nigel Farage, obviously one of the big proponents of Brexit which uh, irked a lot of the establishment in the first place and has been quite outspoken with regards to COVID and the vaccines. And the idea of being cancelled for your opinions becomes all the more real, George, in the context of a CBDC, of a central bank digital currency and a social credit system. So that makes it a lot easier for the government to just turn your a capacity to access your funds on yeah, and off. Because they can just turn your assets off, to your point. It's like a light switch, right? So right now, they can do that, to be clear. Uh, Nigel's a great example of that, or my example earlier with Wells Fargo. If they really wanted to, they could call Wells Fargo and say, hey, don't give him access to his account for XYZ reason. But they have to go through, there's a, a logistical uh, kind of uh, path that they have to go down that isn't that easy, where if the uh, if your assets, your dollar assets, were a liability of the central bank, well, then, then all the central planners have complete control over your dollar or currency assets, and they just call up Jerome Powell and say, "Hey, yeah, go ahead and flip that switch because we don't like this guy." And you know, right now it's just political figures. It's maybe uh, people on YouTube or something like that. But to be very, very clear, the way this is headed. We're on a slippery slope where this isn't just going to apply to Nigel. It's not going to just apply to George Gammon. It's going to apply to every single average Joe and Jane. I mean, you know what comes to mind right off the bat is this kid in, in West Virginia or whatever that came up with that song. Remember Richmond, uh, North of Richmond? I'm sure yeah. you, you've probably yeah. heard that one. You think that guy's going to have a bank account in a CBDC world? Absolutely not. He comes out, boom, gone. Look at the truckers up in Canada. Uh, that's close to where you were. You know, they're just out there protesting uh, peacefully about their rights, for heaven's sakes, to be able to make a choice as to whether or not they want to uh, inject a foreign substance into their into their veins, for heaven's sakes, or into their body. Uh, I mean, this seems like kind of something that we should be able to protest, right? But then what happens to them? Bank accounts gone. Then everyone that even donates to them, your bank account frozen, frozen, frozen. So this is something, in my opinion, that's going to happen more and more and more in the future. And the central planners are going to sell it to the general public as that anyone would write a song on YouTube like Richmond North of Richmond. They deserve to have their bank account frozen because they're some sort of you know domestic terrorist or something like that. There's always a way to spin this to where we're doing this for the greater good. But what happens after a decade or two of doing what's good, right for the greater good, we turn into a surveillance state like communist Russia. Uh, and that's assuming we have a decade or two of whatever technology being implemented for the greater good. And yes, I think a lot of attention needs to be focused on this idea of a central bank digital currency, which, as we've discussed on the show, means that the government can monitor every single transaction that an individual makes, but more obliterating privacy and anonymity, but more concerning can program the currency to work or not work under certain circumstances, to program the currency to not work if it's not used to purchase what is deemed as an essential item or to not work if it's in violation of an ESG mandate or a climate change issue where it's like, and I always bring up this example 
George, you've taken uh, 10 flights to Colombia this month already. You've exceeded your carbon output for the month. So your money as a CBDC would not work to purchase another flight ticket because you're damaging the environment. It's, it's for the greater good or it would work, but with a premium. You have to pay extra for that to make up for your carbon footprint. Well and said. I think you just hit the nail on the head, which is another reason to have purchasing power outside of the system. So it, it, I know it's not realistic now, but it, it, hopefully in the future, you know, what always happens is you have a black market that pops up. And I, uh, not that you'd have a black market for uh, you know, buying an airline ticket on American Airlines or anything. But uh, in other instances, you know, buying diesel for your truck, I think that's probably yeah. a better example. You know, that's something where you could transact maybe in physical silver, gold, or maybe even in Bitcoin, which would allow you to get around that system. And there's just no way they're going to be able to monitor, the, monitor that uh, completely. Now, I think the penalties for doing so will discourage a lot of people from working outside of the system. But th I think regardless of what they do, there's always going to be that opportunity. But I also think that's why it's really important for Americans and for people who are in these uh, Western democracies where we see the whole society on this slippery slope towards authoritarianism to think about a plan B. And I know it's not realistic for everybody, but for those who do have the resources, you know, to think about having a place in Mexico or to think about setting up a bank account in, um, in, in Dubai or in, in Turkey or having a, a Turkish passport, you know, something like that. I just don't see any downside. And we're moving into a world that is going to be very, very volatile very tumultuous. I mean, if I would have told you in 2019 that they were going to lock everyone in a cage for a year and they weren't yeah. going to let you go outside, they're going to shut down the whole entire global economy. And regardless of how much money you have, you are not able to travel. That was on no one's bingo card. No. Right? <laughs> everyone would have called you a crazy conspiracy theorist, yeah. but yet it happened. And then on top of that, then they make these mandates, like we said earlier, that, that not only force you to inject a foreign substance into your body, but in some cases, forcing you to inject that into your kid. This is how crazy society has gotten. And then it, you think this is the end? Absolutely not. It's going to get worse from here, hopefully gradually. But this is a world, that my point, this is a world where you want to have options. Mm -hmm. You want to have flexibility. And I think that's what people really have to start to consider right now, because you don't want to wait until the stuff hits the fan. Because then you're making all these decisions based on emotion, and they're very reactionary. You want to have a specific game plan set up, and then hopefully you never have to execute the game plan. But if you do, you're ready to go. And those options for you and for viewers in a easier way to facilitate would be owning Bitcoin, gold, and silver. Yeah, that and having a bank account set up outside of your political jurisdictions. Again, going back to Nigel, if he would have had a bank account set up outside of the UK, mm -hmm. he, at least he could have kept get, uh, getting paid. You know, let's say he had a YouTube channel or he was getting a paycheck from the government or something like that. At least he could have that paycheck or that Stripe account go to his other bank that didn't lock him out. Right. right, where he only has that one option under that political jurisdiction that sees him as a domestic terrorist, well, now all of a sudden you got a big problem. And that's something that everyone should look into. You don't have to move. You don't have to leave the United States or Canada or Australia to do that. And that's why, at least from that aspect, I think it's a no-brainer. Well, this all becomes even scarier when you look at this development coming out from Sam Altman, which is the brains behind chat GPT. And yeah. I'm referring to the very controversial WorldCoin cryptocurrency project. And this project uses eyeball scanning orbs for users yeah. to enroll. And uh, this is causing a lot of concern because it has taken off quite rapidly, over 2 million signups. Uh, in the first uh, month or so since it's got since it's been launched, there has been some regulatory pushback with regards to privacy. But help our viewers understand exactly what WorldCoin is and why we should be worried about it. Well, the first thing that's insane is, uh, to your point, Sam Altman is the guy running. Uh, uh, what's what his company name? I forgot, but it's basically the Chat GPT. Um, 
But regardless, he's running this huge AI company. And then he sets up WorldCoin. Why? Well, according to him, it's an antidote to the problem that he's solving, or it's a solution to the problem that he's creating, I should say. So he's creating this problem of AI that's going to take away everyone's job. That's what Sam Altman will tell you. So then he says, okay, well, now I've got a solution for that. It's this cryptocurrency that's going to pay you indefinite UBI. Universal basic Right. So he's saying, okay, I'm going to destroy all the jobs over here, but don't worry about it because I'm going to give you this cryptocurrency that's going to pay you for the rest of your life. All you have to do is give me your biometric data by letting one of my orbs scan your eyeball. And I'm not making this up. I know that sounds completely insane and from some sort of Orwellian sci-fi movie, but look it up. It, you'll you'll see that this is exactly what's happening. And now these orbs right now, I don't think they're they're legal as of yet in the United States. That's why a lot of Americans haven't seen them. But if you're outside of the United States, you know, they've got these at, at all the malls that you go down to. And the kids are lining up for like 200 yards just to get their eyeball scanned. They think it's the coolest thing ever. So why? Because Sam is saying, hey, we'll pay you. I think it's twenty five currency units in this world coin if you give us your biometric data. And so the incentive there for a a kid who doesn't know what they're doing is that, hey, this may have purchasing power. But on top of that, by me holding this world coin, it could pay me an indefinite dividend because the sales pitch there is, okay, we're going to take all your biometric data and we're going to give you a digital ID that you can use when you're... um, on Facebook or Google or YouTube or something like that, that, sh- that where the platform can differentiate you from a robot. And also the platform can tell if there's one person per account. Where right now on Twitter, as an example, you can have one person that's got 100 different accounts and you think that it's 100 different people, but it's actually one person. So it's actually a real problem. But then Sam Altman's pitch is, okay, we're going to take your biometric data to give you this digital a code like a social security code online or a social security number online. And then uh, we're going to have all these platforms pay us money for this service. And then we're going to take that money and distribute to all the people that are holding this world coin. So that's where you get that UBI component. And so that's his pitch is that I'm destroying all the jobs over here, but with WorldCoin, I'm gonna provide everyone money for the rest of their lives so they don't have to go to work and they shouldn't worry about the jobs that all the robots are gonna steal. Right. That, that's the, the, the circular logic <laughs> there. Right, and, but you better behave. You better behave, George, otherwise you don't get your UBI, right? You better stick uh, to the, the confines of whatever the social credit system is, otherwise you don't get your UBI if you don't play by the rules, especially in an environment like this. Well, that's the catch, right? So you've heard that saying that if the product is free, then you are the product. You're the product, yeah. If you're not paying for the product, you're the product, yeah. That's right. So like as an example of Facebook. And so that is a little scary in and of itself because they're just using your personal data for that. But this isn't just, hey, we're allowing you to use the product for free because you are effectively the product. It's we have to pay you to use Mm it. It's not even free. It's they have to pay you. So whenever you have someone coming up and saying, hey, um, you know, we just want to scan your eyeball. No problem. You know, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. And we're even going to pay you to do that. I think that should kind of make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. That should cue the old spidey senses and say, wait a minute here. Something isn't right. So, yeah. something wrong with this picture. And it's most likely something that puts us right back on that path towards Orwell's 1984. Yeah, um, definitely very Orwellian in how this can play out. There has been some pushback, though. Before I get into the pushback that this has been getting, which perhaps is a very good thing, I want to elaborate a little bit more on the people behind this. We did say that it's been spearheaded by Sam Altman, He's the CEO of OpenAI. That's the the name of the company. Yeah, Yeah, OpenAI, which is uh, the company behind ChatGPT. It's also backed by renowned silicon venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. What do you make of those connections and bring it back again to the World Economic Forum? Because I believe Sam Altman also has a link there. Yeah, he's one of their young leaders. And they choose like 800 people. And this is per their website. You can look it up. And he's one of their, quote unquote, young leaders who they say is going to shape the 
the vision for the future, or, you know, implement the policies from the global elite, the authoritarians, and basically the Marxist Malthusian cult. And as far as uh, the the private investment firm or the and, angel and investor, and yeah, yeah, I don't I don't really follow them too much. I don't I don't know their background, so I don't know if I can speak on that. But another thing that I'd point out about Sam, and I know this because I did a video on Sam and Worldcoin, is he always attends these Bilderberg meetings. And uh, at the time, I thought mm. Bilderberg, I thought, oh, that was just some conspiracy theory from the past. But they actually do have these annual meetings. And uh, they're, the, the rules, I think they call them Chatham House rules, if mm -hmm. I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. And it's basically what is said here stays here. And yeah. who you see here, who you talk to, you got to keep it on the down low. And he went there this last time, I know, with uh, people such as the guy that runs NATO, he was there also with, uh, I don't know, it was Larry Fink. There was one of the high-level kind of financial insiders that we were talking about earlier. And then also uh, the CEO of Pfizer. And then there was a list of, of several other people. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Henry Kissinger. How could I forget? He was there as well. So whenever you've got like Henry Kissinger and the CEO of Pfizer kind of rubbing elbows with a guy that's saying, hey, let me pay you some money so I can scan your eyeball and get your biometric data, that, that should raise a, a red flag. I think that should, uh, that's a reason to be concerned, to say the that, least. <laughs> definitely a reason to be concerned. Not to drift too far off into conspiracy theories, George, but for our viewers that aren't aware of what the Bilderberg Forums are, um, if you can give a brief background, I know that there's a link to eugenics with regards to them, or at least a theory that this was a World War II initiative, if you can give a quick, uh, I guess, one or two liner to explain why all these people gathered to build a Bilderberg Forum should be of great concern. Well, I, I can't really speak to the Bilderberg Group because I didn't, I haven't done much research there, but I've done a ton of research on the World Economic Forum. And you hit the nail on the head. I, I call them the Malthusian cult and, and they're, they're central planners. So I call them Marxists as well, which I think is an appropriate title. Uh, but to your point, they're also eugenicists. And if you study their history, it goes back to 1971 is when the World Economic Forum was set up by Klaus Schwab. It was called something different back then. But this was a result of the Club of Rome that was set up in 1968. And then they came out with this uh, paper that was very popular at the time. I believe it was 1972 called The Limits of Growth. And it was just basically kind of a, a repackaging of all these ideas from Thomas Malthus. But if you take that, the, the, the members of the group that started the Club of Rome and you go back through their history, you see eugenics is one of the common denominators that uh, ring true with almost all of them. And if it makes sense, right, because if you're a central planner, then by definition, you believe that you are smarter than everyone else. And it's for the good of humanity to take away their decision-making process. It benefits society at large if you have all the power, you have all the control, and you have all the wealth. Why? Because you're so much smarter than everyone else that you're going to be able to make better decisions. And humanity is going to be better off as a result so long as you are the, the quote-unquote dictator, right? If you, if you and all your global elite buddies have all of, of, the, of, of the power. So if you think about that, well, that's kind of eugenics here because we're, the view of a eugenicist is someone that believes that uh, there's people that are inferior, mm -hmm. just, just uh, uh, genetically inferior to others. And so is that a far stretch from being a central planner? I mean, basically that's what you're saying is that you think that some people are predisposed, are better predisposed through genetics, intelligence, et cetera, to make the decisions for all the other 8 billion people on the planet Earth. So well, I think if you just look at it from a common sense standpoint without researching it, that you would come to that conclusion. But to your point, if you actually look at the lineage and the background of the Club of Rome that leads into, you know, Henry Kissinger, Klaus Schwab, and uh, the World Economic Forum, that you're going to see that uh, very, very prevalent along with those, uh, the ideas of Marx and Thomas Malthus. And just as a background for our viewers who may not be familiar with the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset idea, which is laid out very clearly 
on their websites. Yeah. Help us understand what that is. Break down the you will own nothing and be happy line, which again, they have said very clearly and that they have this agenda to engineer this great reset by 2030. If you don't mind giving our viewers a little bit of background there and how this all fits in. Yeah, so they see uh, private property being a <laughs> something of the past, being kind of an antiquated idea, let's say. And it goes back to exactly what we were saying before, that uh, you know, if you're an inferior species, then you shouldn't be allowed to own property. And that uh, we, the global elite, should own all the property and you can just rent it from us. So that's basically the premise of that uh, tagline, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, that they always tout with the Great Reset Agenda. But it, it's much more in-depth than that. And really what it boils down to, if, if you look at all of these things, they sound like, oh, okay, we're going to eat less meat and all these things. But when you, when you scratch beneath the surface, you see that it goes back to these simple objectives that they state explicitly that we need to reduce energy use in, 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 on the planet Earth. Therefore, we need to lower the standard of living and we need to decrease the amount of people that are on the planet Earth. And every single one of these you know, flowery sayings that they have are just meant to pull the wool over your eyes so you don't pay any attention to what they're really doing behind the scenes. They kind of take this strategy of boiling the frog slowly. So you think that nothing's going on and the World Economic Forum is just this benign entity that wants global peace. And the next thing you know, you wake up and you're locked in a cage. You've got a social score and you're you're uh, you know, you've been um, your bank account's been frozen. You can't leave the country. And now all of a sudden you're at the whim of all of these central planners. And we really got on this path. They, they really turbocharged this, uh, the, the direction the society is going back with the uh, COVID. You know, when they locked everyone up and everyone said, okay, yeah, this is not everyone, but the majority of Americans said, yeah, this is okay. This is fine. Go ahead and lock me in a cage. In fact, I demand that you lock me and other people in a cage. Don't make it illegal for me to go to the beach. Make it illegal for me to lock, uh, to walk my dog. And then in addition to that, force me and everyone else to jam this foreign substance into my veins, make me go around and show you my papers, just like 1930s Germany. You know, I got to show you my papers every single place I go. Let, let's. This puts us on the fast track to authoritarianism, to tyranny. I mean, this is the, the slippery slope. This is the road to serfdom that we've been hearing about. We're seeing it play out right in front of our eyes in real time. And I think that they, again, turbocharged this vision uh, as a result of people being compliant over the last three years, and they're just going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing until they achieve this utopian vision of theirs. And if COVID taught us one thing, it's that if you give pa the, the government the power, they will overreach. I mean, we saw tremendous examples of government overreach during COVID, and some would argue that that was a way to test people's resilience and willingness to go along with all of this. Uh, George, I want to bring it back to WorldCoin and potentially a positive development in that it has been facing some backlash around the world, right? There's been pushback from France, the UK, Argentina, saying that there's serious concerns there about the project's way of collecting data. As we said, these silver balls scanning your, your eyeballs to get biometric data. There's also been some pushback from Kenyan authorities, which say that it poses a threat to not only privacy, but also to the economy. Is this potentially a positive that this thing may not take off as initially anticipated? Absolutely. And this is the silver lining. And I want to be very clear. There's a lot of things that we should be concerned with and we should be paying attention to that's happening in the world right now. And I think we just see these cycles over and over and over throughout human history where hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times. I think we're living in a period right now that, that we would all admit those weak men have created hard times. Uh, th that, that's for sure. But the silver lining here is at the end of the day, we, the people, have the power to make all of this go away. Whether it's a central bank digital currency, whether it's world coin, whether it's the, the Malthusian cult, Larry Fink, Bill Gates, 
any of this nonsense, eugenics, uh, the Club of Rome, ESG, all we have to do is stand up and say no. That's it. It's something that's incredibly simple, but it isn't that easy, right? If enough people stand up and just say no, we win. And the example that I always use there is going back to the lockdowns in 2020. You know, I remember in Phoenix, I'm very familiar with Phoenix, about 4 million people there. And they you know, said, you can't go outside, you can't walk your dog, etc. Just imagine if not the whole population, but just imagine if like 20,000 people just said, uh, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. Now I'm going to walk my dog. Now I'm actually going to take my kids to school. Now I'm actually going to teach. Now I'm actually going to keep my business open. They, they would be like, uh, uh, okay, okay, fine. We just, in fact, just saw this, Michelle. I did a story on my uh, YouTube channel the other day about California and some uh, businesses starting to re-implement a mask mandate. And that lasted a, a, a whopping like two or three days because everyone said, uh, yeah, no, I am not wearing a mask. And they said, uh, okay, I guess we're not wearing masks, right? And it would yeah. have been the exact same thing. The, 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 the truckers, I think, were really changing the world. And I truly believe that if Putin would not have invaded Ukraine, uh, that Trudeau would be gone. He, he would be completely out. But if you look at world history, you know, let's go back to Romania in the late 1980s, early 90s, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, they had a dictator there, Ceausescu, that had been in power for decades. He had all the money. He controlled the police. He controlled the military. You know, they didn't even have guns, for heaven's sakes. And what happened is enough people got pissed off enough, went out to the streets, and basically just said no. And the next thing you know, a week later, they take him out back and shoot him. Now, I'm not condoning violence at all, but I'm just using that as an example of the power that the people have, a small minority, a vocal minority. Mm -hmm. We have all the power to push back against these central planners, these authoritarians, and we can win. It just takes enough people like you and others out there on YouTube that are opening up people's eyes to the problems and hopefully they come together and then we push forward to a society which, with far more um, priority placed on individual freedom, liberty, privacy, and free market capitalism. Well, it's a very positive note. And as you say, George, strength in numbers, and it makes it a lot harder to push back when you have that central bank digital currency implemented and people get taken off the system for resisting, for refusing to do certain things. And that's why it's so important to make sure that this doesn't get implemented in the first place, to your yeah, point. Yeah, but the good news is everyone's talking about it. I mean, well, not everyone. Let, let, we're we're, yeah, we're starting get, to see more of a conversation about it. A lot yeah. more people. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I first started talking about CBDCs, it was on my YouTube channel back in 2019. And Michelle, everybody was calling me a conspiracy theorist. Everybody. It was like, oh, tinfoil hatter. They're calling me Alex Jones. Oh, CBDC. What? That's never, ever going to happen. Okay, fast forward <laughs> two years, and now yeah. Jerome Powell is talking about a CBDC, right? And now we hear RFK talking about a CBDC. We hear RFK talking about Bitcoin. We hear sure, RFK yeah. talking about the, the monetary system and sound money. Now, I don't agree with all the things he says, but I think it's absolutely fantastic that he's out there talking about it. Even Ron DeSantis, uh, Ted Cruz are talking about a CBDC. Now you can tell they don't understand the plumbing, which is a problem, but at least they're out there talking about it and creating this uh, kind of a PR movement is the way I see it. And if you look at the brand right now of a CBDC, it's incredibly negative. I mean, is there more? Is there a brand that you can think of that has more toxicity other than maybe the World Economic Forum, than CBDCs. I, I, I can't think of one. You know, they're like the Bud Light of currencies right now, <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. So that is, I think, a huge win in and of itself. We haven't won the war, but we definitely have won the battle so far on that uh, front of people's perception around a CBDC. For sure. And creating awareness is paramount and critical. And to your point, it has entered more of the mainstream in terms of conversation, in terms of political leaders coming out and speaking against it on both sides of the aisle, RFK, Democrats, and uh, a number of Republicans like Ted Cruz, like Ron DeSantis, 
uh, like House Majority Whip Tom Emmer is really pushing against the idea of a central bank digital currency. And hopefully that gains more attention and becomes it less and less likely to actually be implemented. But before we let you go, George, I do want to focus on the bigger picture. And it's a lot easier to implement big initiatives that ultimately lead to losing control in a situation of crisis, as we saw with COVID. And we could be on the verge of an economic crisis, which makes it a lot easier to then come and implement these initiatives, if you will. And you recently did a very interesting video giving your outlook on the macro economy taking a look at the inverted yield curve. And I recommend our viewers watch it in length. But basically, you were saying that an inverted yield curve is signaling that something very big could happen. And if you look at the people that take financial positions based on that information, and I believe you cited Paul Tudor Jones in your video, it may also indicate that they have some inside intelligence that things are about to unravel in a potentially very negative way. So if you could break that down for us. On the Spot with Michelle McCory is brought to you by Meld, the next generation multi-chain crypto wallet that allows you to unlock the value of your crypto without liquidating your position. Undertake easy cross-chain transfers, yield and borrowing by handling your crypto and fiat processes with transparency. Transfer fiat to and from crypto exchanges at low cost and in 15 currencies. Meld, your one account for money and crypto at your fingertips.